Good morning. morning. Aren't you thankful for that promise that we have a home awaiting us? I tell you, last Sunday after after service, I had to go and uh, do a funeral for just a a dear saint that had went home to be with the Lord. And and I read from those those scriptures in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it talks about that day in which the Lord's going to come and Call us home, and I tell you what, there's no greater hope that we can have. There's nothing that money can buy. There's no possession that we can own that can give us that kind of hope and that kind of joy that we can have today. I hope each one of us has that. I hope you've come today prepared to worship the Lord. If you're able, if you would, rise to your feet this morning. We'll ask Brother Matt to come and lead us in a song. And then after that, if you'll remain standing, he'll uh, lead us in prayer. He's glad to be here this morning. Amen. Being this blue jewel right here. I didn't talk to Julie this week, but uh, our songs go right hand in hand. We'll be on page 54. I'll fly away to that home that she just uh, sung about. Turn around there and wave at somebody real quick. Smile at them. Tell him you're glad to see him this morning. We'll sing all three stanzas to I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. this morning. Bow with me. Father, we bow humbling your presence this morning. Father, thanking you for this day and God, just the opportunity to be back here once again with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thanking you for the ones that are here. And Father, as we say always, not by coincidence, but God, for a reason, we're all here to worship you, the true living God. And just thank you for your presence that's here with us this morning. Father, for the things that's happened thus far, We thank you for that, looking forward to what you have in store for us. First off, Father, with our brothers, he stands before us. God, just ask you to anoint him this morning. His words will be your words. Father, we take them and apply them to our lives. uh, God, I know there's others that will be singing and playing instruments and things, and we just, uh, Father, just pray you have your way with that this morning. God, that uh, the things that are said, the things that are done will be pleasing to you and God, in return, that that lost soul or that need that may be in the house, God, may they come to you today before it's everlasting too late. Father, we know that that that's our witness, that's our job, is to share the gospel, to share Jesus with people. And Father, today when we leave the house, not only can we say it's been good here, Lord, but may we be that example that you want us to be, that light in the community, that people would see you through us. 
just thank you for loving us when you don't have to. We thank you for blessing us. We don't have to do that either, but you do it anyways. We thank you for that. And God, most of all, we thank you for that plan of salvation that you sent our way. God, that you extended it to us, and you didn't have to do that either. But you did it anyways because you first loved us. Thank you today, God, for who you are and what you're going to do for us. For it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you would, be turning with me over to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke in the 14th chapter is where our scripture is going to be coming from this morning. And something takes place in this scripture that's a little unique to most of the parables. And, and as we've been continuing this series on the parables, it's hard to believe been going through this summer of stories that we're kind of drawing to a conclusion. We've got three weeks left of it, and this week we're looking at this feast, this parable of this feast that's taking place, this great supper, and then also, not not next week, but the following week, we're also closing this series by looking at another parable of a feast. And these are two different ones, two different crowds that Jesus is speaking to, which makes it extremely unique. The very beginning of the chapter uh, of 14 of, of Luke tells us that Jesus has been invited to, to eat and to come and, and hang out with this ruler of the Pharisees. This upper level Pharisees invited him to come to his house and he wants to hear from Jesus. And he's got a crowd of people that's also there with him. And, and uh, amongst that crowd, it tells us that there was this man, and I don't know, we don't know if he was outside the door watching all that's going on, or if he's actually been invited in, but there's this man that's paralyzed. And Jesus asked him this question. He says, is it lawful, is it okay to heal somebody on the Sabbath? And all these, these religious leaders, they don't know how to answer. That, that could be too much like work. That could be wrong. It could go against the the law, their rules that they had established, because the the people of that day, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees had established all these rules that that went beyond what God's intention of the law was. And and, and Jesus went on and healed him. And and after he healed him, he he gave just a, 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 what we would call a parable saying. And he said, which of you having A donkey or an ox that's fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. You wouldn't let your animal sit there and suffer. So he wasn't going to let this this man suffer. And he he tells them one parable to follow that. And and then we're going to look at the second. We're going to jump down to verse 16 today. And and I will... I'm going to do something that preachers say don't do. Preachers have said, don't don't ever tell somebody whenever you've preached on something before. But some of you may actually keep notes in your Bible. I I preached on this this scripture back a couple of years ago, and we looked at it from the probably correct, like direct uh, interpretation of what it's trying to say, and that's this invitation to go and share about this supper, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a couple of weeks on a different one that Jesus instructs us. But, but I want to look a little bit more today at the heart application of it, the individual application of it, because truly if we think of it in context, who is Jesus speaking to here? He's speaking to these religious leaders that are struggling with accepting him for who he is. Most of Jesus' parables, almost all of Jesus' parables, he's either teaching to his his disciples, his his tight-knit group, the apostles, or those other people that are following him around trying to learn from him. Seldom does he spend time in, in this type of situation. And here, while he does it, he shares these two parables. So we're going to look at the second of those. If you've got your Bibles there, we're going to start at verse 16, and we'll read down to 20 and pause there and pick back up in the Scripture in a few moments. Here's what the Word of God says, beginning at, chap- at verse 16 of chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke. It says, Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all 
with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So, so let's pause there. And like I say, we're going to look at this a little different. We're going to look at this mentality, this thought of something that probably will not be astonishing in, in thought if we think about it, but something maybe you don't consider very often. And, and that's a phrase, you, you are what you eat. You, you are what you eat. I, I, I watched something several, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, uh, a while back, there was this documentary talking about all the, the food industry and all these things, and there was something that changed whenever uh, I was younger that, that probably a lot of you adults remember, but we've, we've kind of forgot about it, in the, in, especially as it relates to the soft, uh, the soft drink industry. Years ago, if you went and bought a bottle of Coke or or Pepsi, I don't know why anybody would drink Pepsi if Coke's available, but some of you do. But if you went and bought something like that and you drank it, it, it tasted a, a little different than it does now because it used to have real sugar in it. You used to be able to get stuff and, and everything had real sugar. But years ago, the industry changed to cut cost. They started using something that we call high fructose corn syrup. And now that's what all these drinks, that's what all kinds of foods, everything is produced with because it's much cheaper. You can still find in, in certain places Coca-Cola that has real sugar and you, you, certain countries that's how it is still. But here in America, typically that's what it's going to have. Anyway, this documentary, as it was talking, it said that high fructose corn syrup has become such a common stay in America that almost every American carries corn DNA on their body, in their, in their body. Like if you were to go and test, if they did a, a follicle sample of, of your hair, they would find corn DNA in your system because of how much of it we consume. So we, those things that we take in, they affect us, right? Sometimes we take enough in and it affects us bad. And, and we become who we are partially because of what we consume. Well, here today, I want us to look at the things that we consume as it talks about this passage and who it affects us, not so much physically as who it, how it affects us spiritually and as a person. This, this first passage, we probably, for a lot of us, it's familiar. Like I say, I've preached on this scripture before. I've preached on this, this passage a lot of times in looking at it just verse by verse and what it's really getting to the, to the meat of it. And we talk about this first part, and there's all these parts of these excuses that people offer, and we look at those individually. But, but let's look at it as a whole, as a principle. This first group that, that we'll categorize, as, as Jesus uh, tells of this, this supper that's taking place, and, and it tells us this invitation's being sent out, these are the people that we'll categorize them as people that are satisfied with leftovers. They're, they're satisfied with leftovers. I, I, I don't know about you. Growing up, we ate a lot of leftovers. Julie now, she, she proportions things where we don't have it often, and I think she's done that intentionally because I don't really like eating leftovers. I, I never have, have been a big fan of it. I guess you, you get what you get, but we... Leftovers, they're never the same, right? Unless it's like beef stew, that's always better. Vegetable stew, something like that on the second day. Chili sometimes. But, but most things, if we go to reheat it, if we go to reuse it, go to, go to, to, to make it again, it's never going to taste, it's never going to be quite as good as what uh, initially it was. And a lot of times in this life, what we try to do is we try to be satisfied hanging on to what little we still have left. 
If you look in this passage, it tells us that that the the master sent out his servants to go out and invite specific people. He had had people in his mind who he wanted to invite to, to come and come to this great feast. And if we think about that, we probably all have places that we like to eat. We have places that we like to go and things we like to do. You just think of whatever your favorite place is, wherever, whatever favorite type of meal there is, this, this great place that you want to go to. And let's say not only do you have an invitation to go to it that it's, you've got the gift card, it's going to be free, but also it's going to be important that you're at it. Maybe it's a business meeting. Maybe it's something where you're, a, a group of your friends are gathering Maybe it's something that can affect your, your life down the road. There, there may be somebody very important to me. And you have this invitation to be able to go to it. Well, here, th- that's what's taking place. And it tells us that they have all these excuses, right? And I don't want to get into the details of the excuses. But, but here's what I, I want us to consider. Here's what I want us to think of. People that are satisfied with leftovers, you know what we, be, what we become? We become a master of excuses, Let's get out the leftovers. I don't want to, to cook again. I'm too tired. I'm, I'm too exhausted. In, 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 in the Lord's kingdom, in, in God's work, do we not do that? Are there not times that we go down that mentality? We can come up with all kinds of excuses why not to do something. I'm too busy. I, I, I've already done my time. I, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. I don't understand enough. We, we come up with all these excuses of, of why it is that we won't do what the Lord has asked us to do. We won't accept and, and come. And he wants them to come not only to this supper, but he wants to fill them. That's what the Lord wants to do for each one of us. As we enter these doors today, did we come expecting the Lord to fill us? Is that the mentality that we had? Or do we come out of ritual or out of duty? Or this is just what we do on Sunday morning? He wants to come and he wants us to feast on what he has for us. And here it tells us that he gives this invitation. And and these all come back with these excuses. They become masters of excuses. You've heard me say this often. And I, and I, I say it often because I believe it's imperative that it resonates with us we're as close to God as we want to be we're we're right where we want to be when when were you the closest to God was it when you accepted Christ if it was that's not what his desire is that might have been an emotional time might have been a highlight of your life but that's the that's the first step When were you at your closest with God? Was it the last time that you came and knelt down before him at the altar and just poured yourself out to him? Was it the last time you went and did some kind of mission trip or went out and served and did something for the Lord? When's that last time? See, if if there's any time in your life that was the the last time that you were the closest to God that you've ever been, and that's not today, then guess what? We're probably living on leftovers. We're probably satisfied with them. And we've allowed excuses to get in the way of growing us closer to God. Uh, An important thing that I I tell couples when they get married, or or I used to, I don't don't do weddings very often, but one of the the important things that, that I talk about is that complacency leads toward to problems. It, it's the same way in, in our relationship with God. Complacency will lead to drifting. And, and, and before you can ever grow apart from your spouse, before you can ever grow apart from God, something else has to happen. And that is you, you stop growing together. You know, as long as you're growing together with your spouse, you're not going to grow apart. As long as you're growing in your relationship with God, you're not going to start growing away from Him. But it takes an intentional effort on our part. And sometimes it takes us making a decision to get involved, to to accept the invitation, to be engaged 
instead of sitting back and making excuses and being satisfied with just what little we're hanging on to. The, the first part is they were satisfied. The first group, they're satisfied with leftovers. The, the second group we're going to look at here that we're going to relate to is those that are just surviving on scraps. Look at verses 21 and 22. It goes on, it says, So the servant came and reported these things to his master, and then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and there's still room. So it, it tells us here that the, the servant does initially what the, the master had said, and he comes and he, he comes back with the report, and it tells us that when he reports back to the master, all these people made these excuses and they couldn't come. And if you notice the master's response, it's not a, a good one. It says that he hears the report, and it says that he, he became angry. He was bothered. And, and, and I want you to understand this today. You may think, you know what, I can, I can get on the back burner. I don't have to study my Bible every day. I don't have to do devotions. I don't have to, to, to come to Sunday school. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. You're right. You don't have to do anything. Again, you're as close to God as you want to be, but I'm going to be straight with you. Just because you're doing the bare minimum doesn't mean God's pleased with you either. Here it says that he sends out this invitation, and they don't respond, and it does not please the master. He gets angry. He gets angry about it. He's not excited about it. And, and it says that he's, he's not happy with being overlooked. And then it goes to this next group of people, these ones that are just, they're surviving on scraps. And, and what does it tell us about them? These were the, the needy people. They were surviving to get by in the world in which they live. It describes them as poor, maimed, lame, and blind. The, the, the poor, if, if we relate that to us, that's those that we're lacking, right? There, there's many people today. They're, they're lacking in the knowledge of the Word of God. And truly knowing who God is, experiencing who He is, they're not committed. They're they're struggling, and and, and so often it's we find people in in our churches, in in the church world, Christians that find themselves struggling with understanding. And, and you know what He does? He invites them in. They're struggling to get by. He invites them in anyway. He doesn't look at us and say, you know what, you've messed up, you've put yourself in this position, I'm casting you off. The, the next group, two of them kind of join together, it talks about those that are injured, those that were, have been hurt. And, and there's some people, they're afraid of getting close to God because they're afraid of getting hurt. They have the fear of, of what somebody else is going to think. What's somebody else going to, is somebody going to make fun of me or laugh at me? If, if the Lord speaks to our heart, every Sunday we, we do something that's been tradition in the church world for a couple hundred years. A lot of times we think this is one of those things that's existed since the apostles, and then it hasn't. But we, we have an invitation at the end of service. And I, and I know there's some of you that have sat back and you've said, you know what? I feel like the Lord wants me to respond, but others might think of me. You say, how do you know that, Brother Andy? Because I've been in your place. <laughs> I, I, I've been where you are. I've been sitting in those pews. And I, 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 even, I'm not talking about as lost. I'm talking about as a Christian. Still been sitting there thinking, Lord, just let this pass. Let me, let me get past this Sunday. And you know what? We still walk out injured. Because he hasn't been able to do a work in us. We're worried about the other people. And we're worried about all the things that could, could go wrong or could cause a problem. And the final one there, it talks about is those that are blind. There, there's no doubt. Probably people here today 
that you have been struggling with sin long enough that it has blinded you from seeing where you need to go. There, there could have been an open invitation given. The, the, and, and ultimately, there, there is in this last group, basically. But there could have been an open invitation given. They could have posted signs up and said, come to this feast. But you know what? blind person would never have been able to see it because of their, their handicap. And that's what sin does to us. If we allow sin to, to enter the equation into our lives and start to take hold, it'll blind us to the things of God. It'll allow us to think, you know what, everything's okay. We're, we're, in reality, we're surviving on scraps. We're just scraping to get by. But in the end, we're not where we're supposed to be. Here he talks about these people that have these problems. And, and you know what, he has a solution for them. He tells us, that he invites them in, and then those people start to come. And in verse 22 there, it says there is still room. There's still room for more. And, and you know what? There's probably some of us today that, that we could be categorized like this feast. There's not, let's be real. There's not some of us, most of us today. We still have room. We still have room for more of God. We have to make the decision to, to allow him to come and to fill that space. Now, we might have to kick some stuff out to make room for him, but we've got a place for him. Some of us might need to allow him to come in in that initial phase. But a, a lot of church people find ourselves surviving instead of being committed enough to thrive. That's his goal for us. Is he wants us to thrive not by worldly standards and wealth and possessions and all these things. He wants us to thrive in our walk for him. He doesn't want us to struggle. He doesn't want us to live life defeated and discouraged and depressed. But we have to make the decision to commit ourselves to him so that he can truly feed us. We are what we eat. We, we are what we eat. The final group that it tells here that we want to look at, verses 23 and 24. It says, after they had told him there's still room, it says, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. The, the final group that I want us to take note of here is those that are starving for more. Those that are starving for more. God wants us starving for Him. He wants us hungering after Him. The, the Scripture tells us in, in, in the Beatitudes, back in Matthew chapter 5, some of y'all may have memorized those when you were a kid. I did, but I'll be honest, I forgot them, so I wrote the Scripture down. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That he wants us starving for more of him. It, it tells us that there's signs. If we look throughout the scripture, there's all kinds of signs for those who are starving. If, if we're starving for more of the Lord, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be focused on the Father. We're going to remove those distractions. We're not going to allow our hobbies, our friends, television, all the activities in the world going on to get in the way of where we should be with God. For those that are starving, they're committed to church. Not because the church is something perfect or because we are the, the best church in the area or we've got the monopoly on God. We're committed to what God has created. And we look forward to it and we hunger for it. For those that are starving, they foresee being filled. They plan on the Lord providing for them. We, when we show up, we show up with our cup turned up. Now, some of y'all may know what I'm talking about whenever I say cup turned up. That's a, a, a phrase that, that probably some of you don't relate to. Years ago, I can remember if you went to a diner, you go to a, one of the diners to eat, 
Every, everywhere they would have silverware already set out, and there would be a, a cup and a saucer sitting there. And if there was a coffee cup and the saucer there, it was always face down. All you had to do, all you had to do was take and flip that cup over, and guess what? The, the waitress knew. Bring the coffee to them. They're ready for it. Pour, pour that caffeine in. If, if we would, would come in, with that mentality, if we would turn our cup up and say, fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, that song, you know. If we actually embraced it, if we lived it, you would be amazed at what God can reveal to you, what he can show to you, and then what he's going to expect of you. It tells us that we need to be starving for him. If we're starving, we'll be gracious in giving not because we've been told to, but because we want to. We'll be faithful to forgive. Faithful to forgive others that hurt us, even if they don't ask for it. We'll search for ways to serve. There's people who say, I don't know how. I don't, I don't know how the Lord could, could use me. I don't think He can. When's the last time we went out and sought out and say, God, what is it you want for me to do? What is going to be my ministry while I'm here on this earth? If each of us are created with a purpose, do you believe you are? Each of us, if we're created with a purpose, then how are we fulfilling it? How have we sought out to find what that purpose is? Your purpose is not here just to consume that high fructose corn syrup and convert oxygen to carbon dioxide. That's not your purpose. God's created you for a whole lot more than that. So we search for ways to serve. We invite others to attend, to have what we have. In this passage, it tells us that he sends them out into the highways and the hedges. And you know what word it uses? I love it. It says, and they compel them. They're, they're doing anything in their power to bring people to the Master. That's His desire for us, that we would have that kind of passion, that we'll do whatever it takes. Maybe it means that we have to sacrifice of ourselves. Maybe you buy them a meal. You say, come to church with me, and we want you to take you out to lunch. Maybe it means that you have to overlook some faults. Maybe it means you have to forgive something they've done to you in the past. He says that they went and compelled them to come. So that the house may be full. And we're not, again, we're not talking about Salmon's church being full. We're talking about the kingdom of God being full. For someone that's starving for more, they put Savior over self. They put the Savior over themselves. That sounds simple, but it's not. People struggle with that. We struggle with that. And I want you to know, folks, I struggle with that from time to time. It's not easy to put ourselves on the back burner. We have opinions and we have desires and we're flesh and blood. But if we want to see the kingdom of God affected by our life, that's how we have to do it. And we do it by having a love for the lost. We have to have a passion for lost people. Listen, we go out in the world today and there is sin abounds. There's stuff everywhere. Turn on the television and I see all of this current culture in which we live and it frustrates me and sometimes it just disgusts me. But you know what I have to remind myself? I have to have eyes like Christ. I have to try my best to show people that's out living in sin that there's something better. I have to try my best to embrace Someone not for what they've done, but for who's created them. Because for each one of us, each one of us, we were created to spend an eternity with God. Hell was created for Satan and his demons. That's not his desire. It tells us if we choose to reject him, that that'll be our destination, but that's not his desire. Tells us that he's, he's, he's gone. Jesus told his disciples there in John 14 that he was going to prepare a place 
for them, that where he is there, we may be also. That's his desire for us. He's up there right now, and he's hammering the nails to your eternal house. He's got a place reserved in heaven for you. But you have to choose to receive it. You know, it's said in California, (laughs) there are over the deserts of California, that there are basically two birds. Now, I, I mean, I'm sure others pass by, that, but there's two that really live in the desert. One of them is the vulture. And the vulture, y'all know what buzzards, we see them around here all the time. Y'all, y'all know what they do. They fly around, they circle around, and, and you know what they're doing? They're looking for something dead. They're just looking for the carcass of a decaying animal that they can come and they can feast on. But, but the other bird that, that they say inhabits the deserts of California is one that's not noticeable. You're not going to see it way up in the sky from a great distance. It's a little thing that we try to entice to come to our houses here. That's a hummingbird. And the hummingbird, as it goes around, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't even see those decaying carcasses. Because that's not what it's looking for. But you know what it's looking for? It's, as it's flying around, it's looking for the thing that most people never even notice. And that's the little bitty blossoms on a cactus. Because that's where it's going to get fed. It looks for this little bitty flower that's bursted out where it can go and find its source of strength. Today... I wonder what we relate more to. Are, 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 we, are we focused more on feeding on the things of this world? Because here's what it tells us is going to happen with the things of this world. Raw, uh, moth and rust are going to destroy them. And one day, everything in this world, it's going to be for naught. It's going to decay and it's going to rot, just like that dead animal out in the desert. Or are we looking for the sweetness, the goodness, the greatness of God? Because we are what we eat. You're going to reflect that which you consume. Today, are you reflecting Christ in your life? Maybe not where you used to. Maybe it's because you've been, you've been just getting by. You're, you're living on leftovers. Maybe it's because you're surviving on scraps. Today, is that the case? Today, it's a, it's a day to make a change and start starving for more. Ask Him to come and be your God, to be your Savior, to go back to being the Lord of your life, not just a part of your life. If He's speaking to you today, would you respond as we stand, as Matt leads us in this song of invitation. If the Lord's speaking to you today and you need to come, would you do that?